Hey, what's up? You're tuned into The Cutting Room, the show where we talk to industry-leading marketing professionals about their content marketing philosophy, process, and pregame before they edit an article live. I'm your host, Tommy Walker, and thank you so much for joining us live today. I am so excited about today's guest. His name is Jay Aconzo, and he is the founder of Unthinkable Media. And Jay is doing everything I want to do with the content studio and more. He is a keynote speaker. He is an author. Uh, podcaster. And before he was doing Unthinkable, he was at Google, he was at HubSpot, he was at ESPN. And his show and his whole philosophy is about trusting your intuition and not the conventional th thinking. So he likes to make the leap from what best practices say you have to do to what your intuition is urging you to try, which if you're familiar with my work at all, you know, that's exactly where my head is at always. I don't want to take any longer. I think we're going to have a lot of great stuff in this episode. I can't wait to be taking notes. So, Jay, welcome to the show. Tommy, good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for, thanks for coming on, man. We finally made it happen. Me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we're just going to jump straight into it. So we have as much time in the world as possible here. Tell me about your content marketing philosophy and how has it evolved over time? Mm. I'll go right to the homepage of my website where I, I've put it of late, uh, which is to not market more, but matter more. Yeah. And I think like I've become known as the guy who talks a lot about putting resonance over reach. And I do think while that might sound a little bit radical uh, or punk rock to some folks, I think it's actually where real results come from. You could define those results as fulfillment, as a craft driven creator because you connect deeply with the ideas yourself, because you connect deeply with the work, because your audience does, right? That's the resonance component. Or you could define your results as a marketer, an executive, a brand builder would. You know, resonance is why people take action. It's what creates trust. We talk a lot about affinity and a lot about awareness, but not in equal amounts. I think these two words do dominate the zeitgeist right now, but awareness mm -hmm. gets most of the airtime. Um, and it's really about affinity because it doesn't matter how many people know you exist if they don't like and trust you. Like the job of marketing can really be distilled down to two things, which is earn trust, inspire action. And we get so focused on inspiring action on these like near-term conversions. You know, when I was at HubSpot, I like to joke, it was tips and tricks are us. It was just blog post after blog post. <laughs> that was basically like substituting a banner ad for a blog post, right? It's like mm -hmm. out comes the banner, in goes the blog post. It's the same amount of uh, kind of like thought to it. It was a single move way of doing marketing instead of a multi-move. This blog post has to yield this amount of leads, this amount of revenue soon. And that's just not at all what it actually takes to earn trust and love. And I'm talking about a company that has done that really well, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I think we're getting so obsessed with being visible that we're forgetting to be more memorable. And that's where our results come from. The depth of connection, the way you actually do your job as a marketer is not to get in front of people, but to ensure that they care. So I am always of the belief, in other words, my philosophy is to matter more, not market more. Now, how did you get to that place or rather how much of an upstream uh, swimming has it been to yeah. get to that spot? Oh, Tommy, Thomas, if I can call you that, Tom, Tom Word, Tom Worth, <laughs> where to begin? I would say that my initial impulses are very, very simplistic, which is I want to make cool stuff with awesome people that helps even more awesome people. That's it. And I like to joke that I've spent 15 plus years in marketing, mainly content marketing, basically running around the industry saying to people, hopefully in smart, clever, sophisticated sounding ways, hey, you know that thing you're making? You should make it good. <laughs> and I can't just say that. No one's hiring that as the keynote. No one is listening to a podcast where that's the intro and the entirety of the episode. So you got to think harder and look harder at what that actually means, right? Like I remember the first episode of my show, uh, we're about to hit 200 episodes. So nearly 200 episodes ago in 2016, the first episode was called Quality Versus Quantity. So there's this mm -hmm. whole, and it, I did not land where you think I might have landed given what you know about me so far if you're watching this, but um, it's not quite as simplistic. But I start in a very simple place which is I just, I always just want to make things that I wish existed. That's it. I, uh, one of my favorite uh, analogies for this is from Tim Urban, the writer behind the blog, Wait But Why. I interviewed him on my show uh, two years ago and he said he writes to a stadium of Tims. 
it, nice. it's so apparent when somebody removes the self it's so apparent when they don't really care you know david bowie talks about not playing to the gallery because you do your worst work and he also talks yep. about wading further into the water than you're comfortable to where your toes just barely don't touch the ground because it's right there that you'll do something exciting and all these themes all these ideas from outside of the marketing echo chamber and we think somehow well we're different yeah, we're also writing articles. Yeah, we're also telling stories. Yeah, we're also creating podcasts and newsletters and writing books and giving talks and guesting on shows. But it's not the same, Tommy, as somebody who's from the arts, someone from entertainment. Really? Because Taylor Swift could yeah. start a podcast where she says, I'm just going to read the dictionary and she get a million fans right away. Like and the charge people who are million the dollars. <laughs> it's unbelievable. We, we refuse yeah. to admit that we're not the first comers to this craft whatever the craft is. And that working in house at a brand doesn't change things as much as we think it does. That ultimately the job is to be good at this. The job is to resonate deeply with the people on the other end. And I don't think you can do that without you finding a way for the work to resonate with yourself, with you. And then you bring forth the best of you, the quirks of you, all these things that make it entirely unique because you're the one thing no one else can access. And is that coming through in the work. So the sum up of all this, like, yes, I've had to bend over backwards trying to figure out, okay, this is what the person who doesn't care about craft or the art thinks and what they want. Mm -hmm. I need to meet them where they're at. And then I need to walk them every step of the way. So it's logical that they conclude, oh, we're, yes, I understand. We shouldn't just make a podcast. We should make an actual show. And a show right. has a premise. So we need to develop that premise. Otherwise, we're just talking topics with experts like everybody else. Like it takes a lot of eating humble pie to admit that you're actually not very good or different at this stuff. Um, but I can't just walk up on a stage, like I said before, and be like, you know, that thing you're making, make it good. Um, <laughs> so it's been a journey to try and figure out how to articulate that in 1700 different ways to marketing. So there are a handful of things that I could ask you here. Uh, the first one would be, cause you have a lot of people who are following your work now uh, paying attention to what you're saying. What is the biggest point of friction? Because our primary per, primary audience here are people who work in-house. What is your primary uh, observation of the friction that people have to have the confidence to say the yep. same thing, especially when they're working in-house? Yep. Trusting yourself. And okay. that could be, there is no gatekeeper. I aspire to do more meaningful work but the internal monologue in my head is preventing me from it. We did a series on the show called Maker Monsters, you know, mm -hmm. imposter syndrome, shiny object syndrome, writer's block, all these things that we basically wanted to journey with other creative people through their own grapplings with their own maker monsters. So I think most of the barriers that we face as creative people happen within our own minds and hearts. Um, now that said, of course, there are external sources of friction, but trusting yourself applies there too. Um, I don't know how many times, you know, I'll get off stage and people go, that's great. I love that, Jay. And I'm very, very grateful for that. I mean, I'm like giving a talk for a living and people are like literally clapping for my work. Like, right. how can you feel anything but grateful for that? Think of how many people do years and years of work and no one claps for them. I do 45 minutes on it. Anyways. So it's yeah. like, I feel amazing that they're like, yes, I'm supportive of those ideas. And then a lot of people immediately go, but my boss. So this is an external source of friction, right? But what I learned is, what, so what they're looking for, typically, the implied question is, do you have any kind of like persuasion technique or a best practice where if I follow this blueprint of how to package and sell an idea, my boss will get on board or fund it? And I tried to play into that at first. And I was just sort of like, I wasn't taking my own medicine. I wasn't really helping them trust their intuition. I was giving them a best practice as a crutch and saying, mm -hmm. well, this is how it's done in some generalized sense. And over time, I switched. And what I started to realize is I had asked them a simple question. Okay, so you want to do, I don't know what a good example would be. You're a blogger and you want to write more narrative style work than like basic how-to blog posts. Everybody knows marketers should care about X. Today, let's talk about X, right? <laughs> you want to get away from that. You want to be more story style. I get it. But you can't change wholesale. You can't suddenly turn around right. or, or you can't tell your boss like, no, we're not going to rank on search at all. And this won't drive any traffic. Like it, it has to actually work for the bit. I get it. If that's what you want, and you still need somehow some permission to do that, and we should talk about whether you actually do, have you sat down and talked to your boss? Have you said, this is what I think will work better. This is what I know you want. 
this is what I think we're doing wrong. And this is what I think would work better. Have you had the conversation with the boss? And I was amazed, Tommy, at how many people said no, because I'm worried they're <laughs> going to say no. It's yeah. like, okay, well, what if they don't? So what I realized is that is another permutation of this idea of trusting yourself where you just need to be able to convince someone else, not by necessarily having some clever way of doing it, but by being more honest, by being more open, by also collaborating with them to arrive at some near-term positive step, not the wholesale solution, right? It's like a policy change for the country. Take mm -hmm. the tiny wins and route to a larger mass change. And so most people didn't really talk to their boss. And so they had a boogeyman boss in their mind, which is probably not the same as the real boss. Right. Why? Because you're not trusting yourself. Now, it's not a panacea. It's not a silver bullet. It's not like being cocky and overconfident solves anything, really. But it's at least giving you a moment to say, I need to get the rep here. I need to attempt and learn. You know, it's this this sort of like, I want this, but haven't tried it. I'm not willing to be bad. I'm not willing to fall flat on my face here. That, that needs to change. Um, a way to sum this up is you want the absolute fix or you want the piece to be brilliant. But right now you don't have those problems. You have a momentum problem. So let's work together to solve that problem. Typically, that's much more of an effort-based problem to solve. In other words, if you trusted yourself to just take the step, good things can follow. You start to feel like, oh, I, I can do this, whether it's publish a piece in a different fashion and learn how to be a storyteller or try and rally some people internally to support something a little bit better. I think... So one of the things that I personally believe, and we talked about this for anyone who's watching this, who hasn't seen this before, one of my axioms of content marketing is the first one is actually a solid premise will get you 80% of the way there. Mm -hmm. And what I've found when I talk to people internally at the larger companies is that two things. One, the confidence comes from the research that they've done to, to come up with a premise that is easy for somebody to wrap their head around. Yeah, um, I think very often when we and I've I've made this mistake before when I was in house where it's like, hey, I want to do this thing. And then the next question that's going on in somebody's head is, well, why do you think that will work? And it's like, you know, it's almost like a trust me, bro type source, <laughs> whereas we're we're actually showing the research as to why that happens. Tell me sure. uh, a little bit about your premise graph. Uh so, pre so what do you mean by premise graph? Well, you had talked about in one of your more recent episodes, the coming up with a premise graph. So uh, premise being, uh, I can't remember the exact thing now. That's terrible. Um, but you were talking about on the X and Y axis. How... Uh, uh, okay. Yes. So it's not a yeah. graph. It's just a way of, it's a template for pitching a premise. So okay. this is the culmination of lots of hard work, which we can talk about the process of arriving here. But for any project, and I come at it through writing books, de de developing keynotes, um, creating shows, both my own and, and client shows, because I'm often hired to develop podcasts and docu-series and, and sometimes host them. The development process really hinges on getting the premise correct, because every mm -hmm. decision from the planning and strategy to the production choices and edit choices you make to the promotion of that vehicle, it all flows from the premise or should. And a lot of brands don't have a good premise. And so the culmination of your premise development process is the X, Y premise pitch. I think that's maybe what you're talking about. Where Yes. It, so X is your topics. That's where most marketers stop. What is the show about? It's about content marketing or it's about editing articles or it's about whatever. And you have to admit, again, here's more humble pie, that there's lots of content already about those topics. And even if you niche down to become the first to talk about this, that's a very thin moat others can step over. Because once you're not first, you no longer have a valuable hook. Right. So I think a lot of marketers get proud of this where the world's first. Guess what happens? As soon as there's a second, that's not a premise. That's not special. That doesn't matter. And also being first is often overrated because you maybe aren't that good at doing it. But anyways, yeah. the topics is the X. What is the show about? But what you explore needs to be paired with how you explore it, which gives the audience a reason why they'd care. So the X is topics. The Y is your hook your conceit, your angle into it, the core belief, the big hypothesis or question that you're exploring. So it sounds like this. This is a, let's use show because it's easy and we're on a show. This is a show about X. Unlike other shows about X, only we Y. And the key here is to not play comparison games because what podcasts right. typically do, especially in B2B marketing is, this is a show about content marketing success. Unlike all the other shows about content marketing success, only we get the raw and unfiltered truth about what goes on 
at their marketing departments. Now, set aside that everyone else claims the same thing, or if right. they hadn't, would would say yes, we do that too. So you're playing yeah. comparison games. It's not they. Your competitor would not readily admit that they don't do that. So that's not what you are, right? You're just trying to hype yourself or puff. It's a lot of puffery. So, mm -hmm. but set that aside. Raw and unfiltered is code for marketing podcasts that are bad and unedited. Like that's all that means. <laughs> So let's get away from that, please. Like every podcast should get right. you the in-depth nuance because it's a podcast unless you have a five minute episode. Anyways, so this is a show about X, unlike other shows about X, only we Y. This is a show about living an exceptional life. Unlike other shows about living an exceptional life, only we ask exceptional people to bring on the three books that most transformed their lives and dissect what was so powerful about those books. This is three books with Neil Pesrija. Now, Neil, who's a keynote speaker and a best-selling author, um, he brings on guests you've heard a million times before. Seth Godin, Malcolm Gladwell, people that you're like, I have heard them a million times, reading right. them, watching them, listening to them. Sure, but you're never going to hear them like you hear them on Neil's show, Three Books, right? My show, this is a show about creative work. Unlike other shows about creative work, only we explore how to make the leap between what best practices say you should do and what your intuition is urging you to try. That would be very unconventional, if not unthinkable to do, right? Um, that's the name of the show. <laughs> Anyways, like that. So, okay, if I'm going to now construct a format and I'm talking to you, I can't say, here's Tommy's background and bio. Here's where he worked. Here's why he's awesome as the first moment. What I have right. to do is spend the first moment building up the best practice to sound inescapable, inescapable like it's the best. In the second block, I then tear down the best practice by revealing the thing that you did that feels unthinkable when I reveal it. But then you're going to ask like, well, why did they do it? And here's why it actually wasn't so unthinkable to break from best practices and trust yourself right. instead. Here's why and you would say it or the story would reveal it. And only now you're like, oh, interesting. So how did Tommy arrive there anyway? Let me yeah. tell you where this all began. Tommy started his career, blah, blah, blah. Right. So I yeah. take a thing that is historically and stereotypically first and I move it to what is that third or fourth, I think in the yeah. flow because I'm clear on my premise and I know what questions to ask to fill in those gaps. So like from the very tiny details of structure and interviewing all the way up to how you pitch your show and provide motivation to subscribe, the premise reveals almost all of those details or at least makes it easier to decide on them. So this is a show about X. Unlike other shows about X, only we, why? A lot of people are clear on their topics. Almost nobody spends the time to develop a hook and you need both to have a premise that actually provides motivation to subscribe. That was one of the main things behind this show is I was asked for years, like, Hey, Tommy, why don't you do a podcast? Why don't you do a podcast? And I'm like, I thought to myself, like, I don't want to be another white guy in marketing with podcasts. Sure. The world doesn't need it. Like, especially an interview style part podcast. That's kind of yeah. where I was going with that. And uh, well, so you can the even, idea you can go of, harder, you can go harder at the premise. Yeah. It's the cutting room, right? Like, yeah. why are we not talking about my cutting room right now? Right. And then we go right. to the actual cutting room of a piece. You know what I mean? Like right. those are, there's ways to like keep, and, and this is built. And I know you're saying we're going to do that in a sec, but like you start doing this over time. And the first episode is yeah. like, oh man, that was pretty generic. I yeah. didn't really respect the premise or explore it. And then 70 episodes later, you're like, this is a tight rundown that we can experiment from, but also stick to if we need to. That is a perfectly built vehicle for the premise. Instead of it being almost like a blog, which is like a catch-all loose right. collection of topics, roughly talking about your space. It's more like being an author where it's yeah. like, I'm going to go really, really deep into this narrow thing. And I can talk about a broad array of things, but I have to fit them you know, or a better way of looking at it is like lenses. Like I have a certain colored pair of goggles on and I'm seeing the mm -hmm. world through that color. That's what the premise does. So yeah, I'm going to talk to this person or yes, I'm going to talk about this topic, but I'm going to press it through this lens, which is my premise and out pops an original view on this. I love that. All right, let's stick to the premise of the show then and stick to the format. Tell me a little bit about your process. If you're going from planning and premise finding, mm -hmm. uh, Tell me about that all the way over to publication. I think one yeah. of the things that uh, I like the most about your show in particular is exactly what you were talking about. You're setting up the premise of every show very early on and then jumping into it, which I think is the thing I've been admiring the most about listening to the show and the work. And I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, please keep going. I'm, 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 yeah. 
Um, it's been a long day. That's helpful to hear. Yeah. The the way we develop stories, I say we because it's it's myself and producer Alana and Evans. Um, and so the way Alana and I talk about the show, it really does reflect this premise led approach. Um, and I think the way that comes out most forcefully is we're always trying to figure out or at least return to this idea that this is a journey to understand something. What is that thing overall on the whole show, right? And let's make sure we're sticking to it and it should come through in our intros, in the episode intro, right? So, okay, it's the difference between what best practices say they should be doing in their situation, or at least if they have that title or job or craft and what they did instead. So when we're talking about ideas, all we're doing is sort of like bumping up against the world, maybe doing some proactive research and going, that made me feel something. I don't know if that's got the ingredients for the story, but at this point, it doesn't matter. Let's bank that into our idea backlog because they're story threads and we're going to pull that later. So if you look at my list of story threads, it's, you know, a name comma brand, a name comma project, uh, a link, because it's not necessarily a story, but it's an idea that maybe go, there's something in here. Maybe we can retrofit the story to explore this idea that I read about. It's a statistic. It's a question. Um, and, and the only way we can get to that, quite frankly, is to know that this is a problem solving vehicle for the audience. So I am always frustrated by the problems I see among creative professionals, content creators, creators that are independent, in-house marketers, and I'm observing what's going on. And I'm trying to ask why, like, I'm not just going to try and rant about this stuff. Why is it that way? What is broken? Oh, we're too obsessed with reach. Okay. Why don't we explore resonance for a little while? What does resonance mean? Let's visit the science. Okay. We learned a little bit there. What does it mean in creative work? Like who is resonating? Can we find an example of somebody? Oh, okay. How about this? Take it to the extreme. What if you didn't do any public promotion for audience growth at all? And it was only about word of mouth. A hundred percent of your growth was through word of mouth or damn near to it. Let's do an episode about speakeasies. Great. We're going to talk to an actual speakeasy owner out of London. And we're going to talk to a woman who builds small, but very resilient, thriving businesses that you wouldn't know existed, but the executives who hire her pay her a lot of money, right? Fantastic. What can we learn about resonance from these people who ignore reach entirely, who don't say, oh, resonance is a way for me to grow reach. Or if I resonate deeper on Twitter, I'll grow reach faster on Twitter. They're not thinking that way. They're like, no, nah, I don't want that. I'm going to downsize the number of people that are aware of me intentionally and build mm -hmm. my business that way. Are you kidding me? That seems unthinkable. Let's explore. So it's this very investigative exploratory approach to say where my audience is standing today is broken. The status quo, we don't like it. We won't tolerate it. Or there's something that's under understood. Un there's a word for you under understood. Let's say under explored. <laughs> and sure. we need to venture forth to that mountain peak. That's the better way. That's, you know, the place of understanding, the place of resonance, the place of craft. I don't know how to get there. No idea. So every episode, we're taking a hack at this jungle between us and it. Join us. Join us on this journey. Um, and so it's a very inviting way to build is to say, I have a premise. I'm going to explore the premise. We haven't figured it out yet. I don't have the methodology. I don't have the book. That's coming, hopefully. But for now, it's like I am on the journey. And everything we do with the ideas stems from that journey. So I am over-indexing on explaining where my ideas come from. Because mm -hmm. again, just like developing the premise or the idea for your show, the episode level ideas or premises determines everything else. Like everything mm -hmm. else gets easier. We feel like we can sprint now, you know, because what good are the practical steps if you're facing the wrong direction, right? So speakeasy ideas. Great. That's a good direction for the show. Now, what do we want to do? Oh, very clearly we can find a speakeasy owner. Very clearly we can find yep. a business consultant that nobody really knows, but in boardrooms, she's revered, right? Like how do we do that? it snaps into place once you have this clarity of purpose. We had uh, Ryan Law from Animals on the show a while ago, and he was talking about how he's focusing more on the premise of good ideas right now and cultivating those good ideas, uh, primarily because we're in an age where AI is getting super duper smart uh, and can write like a human being. Tell me a little bit more about, okay, so you have the premise. Mm -hmm. What's next? So we, we have our premise for the show and then the premise for an episode. Um, then what Alana is going to do is she's going to do, go do some research. So we'll talk about like, we think the story should be shaped like this. We have our rundown, the documented flow that persists every single episode. The audience has no idea it's there, but it guides us because we know we have to hit these beats or answer these questions for a lawyerly logical case every time. 
albeit through a creative, <laughs> highly produced story, to yep. explore something, right? So that's the flow. We don't want to lose you. We're not introducing it segment by segment overtly on the mic, but that's how it looks behind the scenes is there's like six to seven blocks we know we want to fill out. So Alana and I will talk about like, do we want to experiment at all? Does it change the typical flow that we're talking to two subjects instead of several? We talk a lot about the, the difference between a local and a guide. It's a very travel mm -hmm. show like approach, but the local is the person embodying this thing. Like the person watching, they are the person like living in Mexico who is running a restaurant, driving a cab. In our world, they are the in-house marketer, right? That mm -hmm. you are profiling. But then there's the guide. If you're on a travel show in Mexico, it's the academic who studies Mexican politics, or it's the uh, analyst from the sidelines of marketing who can see overall what the industry is going through and why things are happening. You know, explain the what of the local. So, okay, we talk about that a lot. Do we want to have that? Yes or no. We talk about like what experimental things are we going to try? How are we going to improve like the sound and style and have fun ourselves? And then Alana goes off and does some research on potential subjects, or if we know who we're trying to book, she'll start doing research on and, and reach out to the actual subjects. And then within the rundown document, which has all the blocks of the show, she starts to put bullets. Like there's a general mm -hmm. catch-all section up top. And then in each section, she's like, we could touch on something like this here. Or can you find out this in the interview here? Or he's a blogger and we can find what the best practices are of blogging just by Googling it or Jay, you're a writer. You probably know, like, why don't we do voiceover for that section? And you should fit focus here in the interview. And then I'll dive in and rearrange that. And I'll come up with something ahead of the call in half an hour, maybe an hour of prep time that gets me ready to execute. And I'm looking for anomalies. I'm looking for things they're not typically asked or things that I don't understand. I think that's a big problem is a lot of people are asking things they can anticipate the answer to but you should really be asking things you're scared that they won't have a good answer for because you genuinely <laughs> don't know. That's yeah. the gold. Um, I'm looking for opportunity for them to tell stories, not examples, stories, right? Not like, oh, for example, we did this. I'm like, where did it start? Where did it go? Tell me about the pain, the problem, what changed, all that. Um, and then at the end of it all, we have this like nice kind of collection of ingredients to do the real cooking, which happens in post. A lot of people don't realize, too, that TV operates very similarly to that. Uh, any scripted drama, it's the same exact thing. You've got yeah. everything that happens in the first, before your first and second and third commercial break. So it's like, it's really, <laughs> it's awesome to hear you talk about it like that. It, um, I'm a simple guy to understand, really. This is it. This is the way to understand me. That's pretty much it. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. So thank you for watching The Cutting Room. <laughs> um. I could continue down this thread. I absolutely could, but let's talk about your pregame. So you have, mm -hmm. you've done the research, you know, the premise yeah. of the episode, all of that goes into that. Now, before you're sitting down to cut an episode or to write a piece, uh, any of that, what's your yep. pregame before you get into the actual whittling down of things? Oh, I love this question. Is it? okay if I share a screenshot or look yeah, at an sure. actual script I'm working on today? Absolutely. Can we do that for your yeah. audience? Okay. All Even right. Better. Cool. Let's do that. So I want to show you an actual script of mine. Um, here, I'll do the window view instead. Here we go. All right. So can you see it should say F200 V2? Uh, yes. But while we have the screen share up, let's both mute our cameras so uh, awesome. our audience can see that just fine. Good idea. Good call. Cool. I'm, oh, I'm getting like a whole cascade. We're getting the, the mirror. The Should I? Mirror. Let me exit out then. It's not working out. No, no, abort, no. You abort. can go to the, you can still click on the script on the tab. And now it switches. There we go. Yes. Perfect. Great. So you have a nice clean view then. Yes? Yes. Great. Perfect. All right. So this is an actual script. We're, we're, we're publishing episode 200, which is a radical break from the typical type of episode, although it'll feel like there's like a house style to the show. So I think it'll feel like, oh, yeah, this is an unthinkable episode. Um, but the flow of it, very, very different. Um, and so what I end up with is a transcript from Alana after we've recorded. So all the research is done. The, all the interviews are done. In this case, I think we interviewed seven people, something like that, targeting like a 35 to 45 minute runtime. It's probably going to be 50, 55 to 65, but um, talk to seven people, un unlike most episodes. And so what I get is this transcript and you can skip anything without a color, but the, trans trans the transcript has like all these sections of different voices. My pregame is almost part of the game, which is to start editing this script, 
I'm going to pseudo perform the voiceover that represents my cold opens. So my cold opens are always similar, not the same, but like it is me, not the guest, not a pull quote out of context. It's a cliche. It doesn't really work. You will always be better at setting the tone and raising the stakes and holding people's attention and getting them to keep listening or watching. You'll be better at that as a producer and creator than your guest will by pulling a quote out of context. So I'm of the mindset you should always do your own intros. Mine end up being something experiential, something evocative or medical, metaphorical to represent everything else to come so that you have uh, a high intention to continue watching or listening, in this case, listening. And so I'm literally trying to write as if performing. So I'm writing the script, acutely aware of what I'm seeing or hearing um, in my head. And I'm adding little performative elements like ellipses for pauses or you know, all caps for emphasis, you know, line breaks to represent pauses. And I'm scripting this out and I won't proceed. In other words, I won't move to the actual interview tape what might some people might conclude is the actual edit that I'm doing off of Alana's assembly um, until I feel like I've nailed the intro because it's all a shell game, much like the premise of the show influences the premise of the episodes, the intro of the, sh the episodes influence the rest of the content, right? So it's like sort of the external veneer or shell around the content that I'm trying to nail first to set the tone for everything else. Well, if I did that, everything else gets a little bit easier. And I'm also now in the headspace of what I sound like as podcast J, not, I don't know, interview subject J or writer J. So I am basically trying to perform while drafting and then edit, edit, edit. And I will out loud to myself, read this one last time to be like, yes, I think I've nailed it. And now it's cemented in my brain and away I go rearranging, editing, communicating with Alana, trying to put together some kind of coherent flow to the episode. So there we go. That was my pregame. Oh, you're on mute. That is fascinating. We haven't had anybody on the show yet actually show what that is for them. So, like, that is super cool. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, okay, so we've talked about resonance. We've talked about uh, the process for finding the good ideas and then the production of those ideas. Now, the pregame of editing those ideas down let's jump into the edit and while you're pulling that up you mean the edit of the other other the other the, yes okay, cool. the one that we're looking at today yeah this i sent to you primarily because i didn't necessarily feel that it had a lot of that in fact it fell into the uh standard <laughs> content marketing, something we would find in the toolbox, you know, the type of piece that we're trying to go after SEO. Yep. And uh, this is what we see most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, let's both mute our cameras. Okay, I'll do that and too. And there we all go. All right, we're in, the, we're in the piece. Can I get a little context? Is this somebody that you're working with, a friend of yours, your piece? We're no, all in the audio trying to do good work. So yeah. whose is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Um, the way our show works is we have audience uh, submissions. So this is somebody okay. from our audience right now. Cool. Which... Well, if you are watching or listening now or later, know that I know you're trying to do good work and also know that we're putting on a show here <laughs> for whatever that means. But yes, I, uh, I am going to tear into this piece, but it comes from a place of love. Let's start that way. All right, let's do it. Cool. Um, so how do we proceed here? You want me to just riff on the comments I made or? Yeah, if, um, and hold on just a moment, everybody, if you would like to follow along, uh, we are putting the link to the document in the chat and yeah, let's just, what was your first impression of the piece? And then we can start walking through some of the comments that you put out here. Sure. Um, it, it feels like, and I think I wrote this at the very end, but it feels kind of like a, tw a classic expected 2012 blog post trying to compete in a 2022 world like it's it's pretty void of any tone of voice personality i didn't get to know the individual behind this or the brand behind this whatsoever the point of view is non-existent and it sort of didn't stick to one cons consistent theme like I, I am not sure what is trying to be achieved by writing the piece other than throwing a lot of key terms at the audience which can stress them out um, so it sort of acts more like a glossary of terms um, and a, like a list of ideas 
than it is any kind of like, like the logic was missing of like, here's what you're going through. Here's what you want. Here are the problems with that. So a big piece of my feedback that I'll talk through with you, Tommy, is the proposed structure I'd recommend to take this from, we have some factual correctness going on here and a whole lot of terminology to a much tighter trimmed down um, sort of laser focused way to help you change or improve something if you're the reader. So I, I didn't get that flow feel from it. And I think the way I'd sum that up is it felt like this era of content marketing that was predicated on being rather generic and sterile. Mm -hmm. I would like, as we continue to go through this, to also look through the lens of uh, good storytelling versus effective storytelling. You mentioned oh, that on that. Yeah. one of your recent episodes, and that stood out to me quite well. Sure. And, and I can really briefly define that for folks. So I think we try, yeah, we look at our heroes, we see in, in our echo chamber or elsewhere, like a certain bigness or artfulness to what they do. And it's like, I could never, or I'm going to try. And either way, I think it's hard to anchor correctly to folks that don't have your specific job because you're trying to be good and what is good, if not some subjective thing that others decide for you or about you. Um, so rather than trying to be good, try to be effective. And I think the difference is a good storyteller can grip us, but an effective storyteller moves us. And much more specifically, they move us to some kind of meaning, which prompts us to reflect and or act. That's where our results come from. So not, literally you're affecting the other people who are reading you, um, not just holding their attention, but you are moving them to action. That's what we need in our jobs. So I love that dichotomy and happy to use that as a lens today. Awesome. All right, let's let's uh, let's go through the first handful of comments here. Uh, immediately, let's start there. Immediately, why do we need to start with jargon? <laughs> what? I'm sorry. I, we're putting on a show. Whoever wrote this, I love you. Let's grab virtual coffee. You're the best. What the F is full funnel marketing, if not just marketing? Like what we're really talking about, I saw this a million times in the piece, is we're saying full funnel. We're saying full funnel. We're saying full, where all you need to say was, was marketing. Like a, a full funnel marketing strategy is a, is a marketing strategy. Um, so it really felt like what we're trying to do is arbitrage a term that's sort of void of meaning, but people are buzzing about it. And by arbitrage, I mean like you're getting in when the opportunity is, it's cheap to get in and you're trying to then like flip some results before it gets saturated and then you get out. Um, take advantage of a trend, take advantage of a new channel, that kind of stuff, being early to something. But there's not much meaning behind it and that's the job. Full funnel marketing. What does that mean? I suppose we're trying to define that, but everywhere I saw it defined, I just saw marketing. So in my head, I felt like the only people who are going to respond well to this are people who don't know marketing at all. And if that's the case, as I scroll down the piece, if I'm this entry level marketer or a business owner who has to also do marketing and figure it out, then I'm overwhelmed. So you're kind of caught in the middle. It's not a term that's going to appeal to sophisticated people because they're going to go, yeah, this is just called marketing. Why are you inventing a term or using jargon, even if it's popular? I'm not trusting you as much as I could be. Or I have no idea about marketing and that's who you're appealing to. So the term is fine, but the execution really starts to stress me out because, oh my God, look at all this stuff I have to do. How? I don't know. I don't feel empowered. I feel overwhelmed. So I think that that jargon term, yeah, I can snark about it for entertainment value, but it also just felt like it didn't serve the strategy of the piece. As I was looking through this, because you had mentioned, um, I talk about something called uh, Taurus knowledge. And that's something that I felt kind of got out of the piece. And what I mean by Taurus knowledge for anybody who does isn't familiar with this is when you're a tourist, say in a place like New York City, you know all the major landmarks, right? Times Square, Empire State, et cetera. If you're, and, and when you write about that, those are the things you write about. If right. you're a local, then if you have to go to those areas, you don't necessarily look at, you know, those major places. You might go, here are the uh, places that are nearby. So go to Grace Papaya or Blue Dog Kitchen, or these are all <laughs> nearby. And then if you're uh, a local, you're talking about things like, oh, yeah, the bar on 76 in Amsterdam has the best burgers, right? Or the right. bodega down right. the street, they have the best, I was corrected the other day, heroes, I say subs, but uh, heroes uh, in, in the area. And, uh, and that's something that I feel like when I was reading through this uh, was kind of missing as well. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mentioned it's caught between, you know, that, that buzzword idea catches you between two things is if it's for savvy people, you're going to lose people immediately with the terminology, but also the piece doesn't back up the fact that you're speaking to a savvy audience. If it's for an introductory audience, I guess you did a lot of introductory terms, but you overwhelm them and the, the jargon doesn't matter quite as much. You can roll with it. Um, and I think this shows up right in the headline. What is full funnel marketing? How to build a strategy? I think those are two different pieces. That's a gift. You've discovered now you actually have enough material to write two different pieces. Start with what is full funnel marketing. Go ahead and draft how to build a marketing strategy, or if you must, a full funnel marketing strategy. And then when you write the second piece, link to it at the bottom of the what is post. And what I saw here is something that's symptomatic of a marketing tendency, which is we got to be everything to everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can't, you know, or you got to write like a pillar type piece. The pillar is a think of the vertical visual that the word pillar evokes. It's you're going, you're, you're building up, or I like the idea of going deep down into the ground, but you're going into one idea for a while. This goes into lots of ideas in cursory fashion. So it's a lot of words. It doesn't necessarily make it a pillar piece. Right. So I think there's a couple of instances where I'm seeing that we're kind of caught between multiple purposes to the piece or multiple ideas that drive it. Nice. Something I mentioned before, uh, too, is if we're talking about the premise, what are the pillars? Like we talk about pillar content, but what are those pillars supporting? And that's the right. overall premise of what we're looking right. at. Um, OK, let's talk about what are the open loops yeah, Feels so like... somewhere down here, let's see. I want to try to anchor to my comments here. Yes. Uh, here we go. Um, so this is a very popular way to open articles, and I think it's a missed opportunity to really like raise the stakes and grip people. It sort of assumes too much. And I, I've joked even in this episode, there's a classic marketer way of opening a piece. It's like, everybody knows the importance of X. Today we talk about X. So this, this kind of a missed opportunity to grip the human being on the other end and ensure that they know this is going to help them in a big way. It's much more about the topic. It's much more about, there's no hook. Um, and so that's what this represents, this line here. Customers have an unlimited way to interact with your brand throughout the buyer's journey. And the best way to consistently reach them is with full funnel marketing. So this is a post about full funnel marketing. And yeah, I know it's like got the title and the terminology, but really every post is a post about solving their problems. And so you have to take into account what they're going through. And also the fact that they are looking for excuses not to read you. And so instead of focusing on the thing immediately, focus on the experience that the audience is going through and really agitate that pain. If you're trying to portray something like full funnel marketing, I'm just going to say marketing. If you're trying to portray marketing and creating a good strategy in marketing as the solution to the pain they're going through, right? Um, and so that's called an open loop or, or it could be positioned rather as an open loop. Um, that's just a, a moment or a sequence of descriptions that leaves questions on the minds of the audience, right? So I'll just redo the first two lines vocally as an open loop. I'm not saying this is the good replacement because it's still generalizing, but here's the open loop version of, the, of a general open. Um, customers have unlimited ways to interact with your brand throughout the buyer's journey. And among all the ways you have to market and sell to them, one looms largest as a way to react to the fact that the buyer's journey is a mess. Great. Okay, so not a great open, but it does contain an open loop, which is what is that one way, right? I walked downstairs, grabbed a cup of coffee from the mug that has my five favorite words on it this morning. What are those five <laughs> favorite words, right? Nothing happened in that story, but you want me to keep talking, even though I didn't talk about anything that important or powerful, simply because you have questions and I'm gonna answer them. So the piece needs to sort of lean into their reality, what they're struggling with from their perspective, not the thing you're talking about in any abstract way. I think that's really what I'm driving at here is the classic early content marketing approach, remove the humanity. The writer didn't show through, but the person being written to didn't show through either. And it was much more about this like sterile, generic description of the keyword of the topic. Um, but instead really lean into what they're struggling with and what, and, and acknowledge what they want and why they're not getting it. And then leave some room for mystery and drama and questions. And today we're going to go into that, right? Even if you don't write that specific line. So that's the open loop comment that I left there. It's not just grabbing attention. It's the ability to hold it that allows us to earn time, um, which allows us to earn trust because trust is built over time. 
Now, how would you, and I know you, you, you've kind of already touched on this, but how would you infuse a little bit more personality into this and then tie it to the lesson? So you went downstairs, you grabbed your mug with your five, five favorite words on it. There we go. Um, now yeah. here's the lesson. Yeah. When you, you the personality thing is interesting. Cause like you don't want to invent artifice will kill you quicker than lack of personality, like clearly mimicking someone or trying to insert some quirks that you know you have, but it doesn't really work. Or it's like someone said, we have to be funny. So I'm trying to be funny and I'm not. Um, <laughs> so don't go in that domain, that territory to insert more personality is a couple of things. One is what is your overall brand point of view? in general, it should show up everywhere, right? So if I'm taking this piece and you're like, Jay, write about marketing strategy. Well, okay, my whole deal is about resonance and craft and creativity and mattering more, not marketing more. Like that's part of my personality coming through. I need to allow that to be imbued in this piece or I need to imbue this piece with that. Okay, how do I do that? Well, if I'm writing about how to do a full funnel marketing strategy, AKA a marketing strategy, I'm going to, ah, <laughs> I will open by talking about when most marketers picture creating a whole end-to-end -end strategy, another phrase you can use instead of full funnel, I, they picture a funnel, right? They picture awareness and blah, 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 blah. And, it's and the game devolves through daily stresses into a game of extremes. Either turn the screws faster to convert more people to the bottom sooner or go to the very top of the funnel and make it as big as possible. It's like getting in front of a million people would be the absolute best way to do marketing in some of our minds. But marketing is not about getting in front of people. Marketing is about ensuring they care. So rather than think about a funnel, what if we thought about it like a series of concentric circles? Today, we're gonna rethink how we visualize marketing so you can rethink your entire marketing strategy, not just to get in front of people, but to ensure they care, right? And then I'm gonna go on and make the case like, all right, so this is the funnel, throw it out. Here's concentric circles. Here's a description of it. How do you use these now to develop your marketing strategy? Well, let's go into what a strategy is, what you need. Let's revisit the circles one more time and go piece by piece to rebuild that now that you know what a strategy is and what you need. And in the end, remember, if you want to connect deeper, drive more results, inspire your audience, and above all else, like resonate with people so that they act, remember these five things. Like, thanks for reading, you know? So that that's the way my personality is coming through there without me ever inserting like personality quirks, right? I'm just right. letting my belief about this come through very forcefully. And then as you write more and more and more, the personality quirks start to come out because you start to play and you start to feel more confident. So start with the beliefs. That's a part of your person. That's a part of your point of view as an organization or individual. And then over time, you'll start to figure out your personal style, just like we do with handwriting. You know, you write, 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 and eventually you have your own handwriting. So don't overthink that part. I do want you to think strategically, however, about adding your proactive point of view on top of your topics. What's cool about that, and this piece was clearly written for SEO, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> is that, it, it, this is something I've been trying to explain to people too, is not what is, and then tell me everything everybody else says, but what is it to you? What is it yeah. to your brand? Right on. How are you thinking about it and approaching it? Because it's going to be a little like this. You could take the, you could take the, the company's name off of it and then it makes no difference. I right? love that you said that. I think I put it somewhere in the comments up top, but it's like, this is commodity content. Now commodities yeah. are not useful or useless. Commodities are not bad. I do mean it in somewhat of a derogatory way, a negative way, but, but commodities themselves sometimes can be worthwhile. In other words, like sometimes you, you need, corn, you need flour, you need eggs. They're, they're commodities, right? Iron. Uh, a commodity is a commodity. It, it doesn't matter where I get it as long as it's all there, as long as it's intact. And, and this is a post that's like reasonably intact, like factually correct and defines a lot of terms. And But it's a commodity. And in other words, the source doesn't matter. And so the game has to become if you sell commodities or in this case, push content in the, that are commodified, um, then you can only reach people first by optimizing better and shouting louder. That's it, because if you don't reach them first, they're gonna get the same thing from somebody else. And to them, it doesn't matter. How to run Instagram ads is how to run Instagram ads. What is a full funnel marketing strategy is what is a full funnel mark. I don't care where I get this. I'm just going to Google and searching for it. But what we care about is that we, as the brand, as the communicators, matter 
there's that word again, to the audience. We want you to trust us. We don't want you to just read a blog post and then you're out. We want you to develop a relationship with us to then take a more high friction action, subscribe to the email list, respond to the email, um, take a demo of the product, buy the product, refer others to our company, our content, our product, et cetera. Like we are in the business of developing meaningful relationships. And for years and years and years, marketing has been just like careening towards a dangerous end game, which is um, to, to get in front of people. But that's not what marketing is. It's necessary, but wildly insufficient. It's about ensuring they care. And it's really hard to do that when what you offer in your content is the same as what everyone else offers. In other words, a commodity. It's useful, but it's not very like self-identifying. It's not very trust building. Um, it just does not do the job that marketing is tasked with doing, which is to ensure other people really, really care. It. I, I had this sort of existential crisis this morning, actually, thinking about am I contributing to the noise? And what stands out to me about the way that you just framed it all was that as somebody, if they're looking for this and they're going through search results and talking about, you know, you're talking about concentric circles and nobody else, say this is for a marketing firm, which I don't believe it is, but if you're talking about that approach and how you approach it versus, not even versus how everybody else, just matter of factly, mm. it really is something that will be noticed because everybody else is doing the same exact thing and right. people will right. people people care about the person who's like i want to work with somebody who doesn't necessarily think the same or doesn't think like everybody else uh yeah yeah and that's that's one way to do it for sure and i mentioned the premise pitch earlier this is a show about x this is a blog post about, post about x unlike other blog posts about x only we y your competitor or someone who would write or create the same exact type of content as you should freely admit, oh yeah, we don't do that. We don't believe that. Oh, Jay really believes that like you should just reach a small number of people very easily and let, help them fall in love with you and not worry about like tons and tons of net new people. Like whether you call that like smallest viable audience like Seth Godin or a thousand true fans like Kevin Kelly, like, oh, that's what Jay believes. Eh, that's not what we believe, right? And like, no problem, high five, handshake, hug. My work isn't for you or my work isn't like yours. But there's got to be this freedom of admitting, just like with Neil Pasricha's three books. Yeah, I also interview big luminary names about their success. But no, I don't ask them to bring three books. So yeah, Neil's show is different than mine. Like your competitor should be able to look at your content, look at your brand positioning and be like, yeah, no, we are, we are different. Like they believe this and we don't, or we believe that instead. And that's really hard won. That is built takes a lot of reps, a lot of content, a lot of internal conversations, a lot of external talks with your customers. But over time, that becomes the secret sauce to the extent there is such a thing of differentiation. It's not about shouting louder. It's not about pulling a stunt. It's not about a gimmick. Like there's too many marketers trying to put confetti on crap. It's like, <laughs> yeah, we basically just write about or interview the same people as everybody else. But like we ask them to eat hot wings on our marketing interview show. Yay. That's just confetti <laughs> on crap. Like the substance itself is where you actually start to differentiate if you understand your belief system. So my, my rally cry to everybody watching or listening is lead with your beliefs more forcefully in everything from the tiny definitional posts to the big you know evangelism type moments in the public eye. And, and a lot gets better when you do that. That's so awesome. Uh, all right, let's continue... Let's continue through the edit here. We're making a ton of overgeneralizations. Uh, the solution is to anchor the story. I love this comment. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is what we get, again, when we're not sure like what our point of view is or we're not trusting ourselves to insert it or we're, you know, it's decision by committee. So it's like, well, you got to mention the sales funnel too because like we're on sales or we're product marketers or whatever. Like there's any number of reasons a piece could end up like this. Um, and you see this show up in, I think, these very quick, flippant statements. Like, we think of the sales funnel as a straight line. Okay, be very sure that we do. Because a lot of people already know what the funnel is or think about other variations of the funnel. Again, who are you speaking to? Maybe someone who doesn't know marketing or sales. So if that's the case, they don't think of the sales funnel as a straight line. They don't think of it at all. Um, so again, who you're speaking to can inform this. But I think this is a symptom of the actual, like the illness I tried to diagnose here was, can we just rework the flow? Because we kind of keep returning to, there's this assumption we're making and that's bad, or here's this terminology that you need to know. 
it's getting a little bit away from us. So to revisit like the through line is to create a better structure. Um, so the, the first half, actually before stages of the marketing funnel, not first half, but the sort of opening salvo here, I think should serve two purposes. And I can, you can see this in the comment to the side here. One is instantly align with your audience. And I do that through belief systems, right? You know, I, very easy friction that prevents the wrong people from getting into my ecosystem and attracts the right people, um, but instantly align with them and then open a loop to ensure they wanna continue reading. And so there's a few pieces or beats to that, as you can see in the comment. Open with a shared goal, because your audience arrives going, why is this for me? Like I did whatever, I did this Google search, I think it's for me, why is this really for me? Okay, well, you know how you want to achieve X? Let's talk about how we do that in this piece. That's a crude way of doing it. On a stage as a speaker, you can't get up and reveal your ideas right away. You have to get up and say something like, we all wanna do great work. I mean, nobody here aspires to be average. So why is there so much average work coming out of our companies, right? It's like, oh yeah, okay, this person has my best interests at heart. So the first moment is just getting the audience to agree. Yep, you're going where I wanna to go to. You're addressing my goals, not the topic of the post, but my goals. And then later you show them how the topic of the post helps them achieve those goals. So that was missing in this piece. The second is they're gonna wonder, aren't I already working to achieve that? So what are these people doing that you're writing to in their marketing today? Acknowledge that. So you want to grow your business and you kind of have this assumption that you make early in the piece as the author here that it's all over the place. The marketing and sales cycle is everywhere. We think it's a straight line. It's actually much more like a maze. And to match that maze, here's what you're probably doing. You're doing this, you're doing that, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're doing that. And it's exhausting, right? And they're like, yeah, I am doing that. Yeah, I am exhausted. And then you can hint, well, okay, well, there are some problems with this. And it always feels like the solution is to have a huge marketing budget and years of marketing experience. But today in this piece, we're gonna explore why without adding any resources, you can solve the problems that are hidden from view in your current marketing tactics. <gasps> okay, what are those problems? I wanna know, how do I do this? I don't have to add resources, tell me more. So that's like the best possible structure I think of an opening to the piece. And to bring it home really quick, Tommy, because I know I'm going long here, but um, then the first is, so here's the problem with the status quo. You start to really agitate their pain. So this is how we typically do sales and marketing today. We think of it as a straight line. It's more like a maze. Let me talk to you about why that plagues our businesses and why the way you are currently doing this, dear reader, is broken, even in ways you haven't observed, but we have. And they start to trust you. And then they go, oh crap, so what do I do instead? And you go, well, consider this change. Consider that the problem is not finding the next new tactic, shiny trend, exciting new social network to be on. The problem is that you haven't considered the full marketing funnel. And that's what we have to do. And then you tell us, people go, okay, I'm intrigued, but what does this actually look like? Now, before you break down how to consider the full funnel, give them an example of the story. Be like, let me tell you about Death Wish Coffee. Let me tell you about uh, 360 Learning in the UK. At first, they did their marketing much like you. They did this, they did that, they did that. They didn't consider the full marketing funnel. And then they reached this moment where it shifted and here's why it shifted and here's what they did afterwards. Today, that company is the leading provider of X in their space. They've raised 50 million in capital. They have customers like Acme, an example company, right? So they are thriving. And a big pivot point, a big reason why they're thriving was this embrace of the full funnel marketing approach. Now your reader goes, okay, I'm inspired, I'm in, I know you have my best interests at heart, that shared goal you mentioned up top. I know you know I'm already trying to get this, so you're not ignorant to what I'm going through. And I see the problems with my current way and what it looks like when I do it your way. How do I do it myself? And then you go through the methodology. You start to use some kind of framework. You start to teach the tactics. You start to define the terms. The bulk of this piece can be tightened up, not by changing what it is sort of thematically, but just by focusing what these things should be and maybe killing a few of these sections to convey that. And at the very end, it's like, wow, I've been through such transformation. There's a before and after moment before I found this piece and after I found this piece, like I'm ready to go. And you're like, hold on, I just wanna rev you up one more time. And you end by giving them a bit of a rally cry. So if you want to achieve this goal and you remember that the way we're doing it is broken and you encounter all these problems, then here's the thing you have to know. 
this is the change to make full funnel marketing as a, as an approach. Remember to do this, remember to do that, remember to do this third thing. And that is how you can grow a thriving, sturdy business today. It's what, um, Erica Schneider from Grizzle says, synthesize, don't summarize uh, at the very end there, yes. which I thought was awesome. Yeah. And right. if we can pull our screens back up here. Sure. We'll enable our camera. Mm -hmm. And uh, it reminds me of the quote that you brought up on one of your more recent episodes about storytelling from Ichigawa, which is stories are about one person saying to another, this is the way it feels to me. Can you understand what I'm saying? Does it also feel this way to you? And you're bringing yeah. that into the introduction of the piece. Uh, right, right. Because remember, you're which, not just informing. You're not right. just defining the terms. You're not Wikipedia for your space you're much closer to maybe Wikipedia meets an op-ed column. Like you yep. have a point of view, you're trying to urge them to do something and make it feel urgent by structuring it the right way. You're making an argument for why they should understand and get on board with this thing you're teaching them. And this applies to the grandest of stages with a giant audience and a keynote speaker who's there to inspire and the most tactical and narrow of blog posts. Like look hard at the created craft and you see that there is a method to the madness. There is a structure. And it's not just to move people through the experience, like with segmented line breaks or jingles you play. It's to make a logical lawyerly case for whatever it is you're, you're hoping the others see they should be doing too, right? Cause you're already there. You're already at the promised land. You already know the definition of the piece or the, the word or whatever you, you are further along than they are and you're trying to catch them up, but you can't lose them along the way. Right. Um, and yeah, that can be because you're boring, but also because you jump too far ahead or you missed a piece of the logic. Um, so structure, I think, can breed a lot of creative innovation. It's not something that like holds you back. It's something that unleashes you to think about the things that now become unique to you, like yep. personality, point of view, stories you select or don't select, you know, multimedia you add or don't add, all that fun stuff. We could talk for a million years about studying the technique behind all of that too when i was sure. in school they talk about i mean we're not going to because we're at the end of the episode but <laughs> um but it's always freedom through technique if you're practicing this stuff broadly and then you know within a paragraph by paragraph uh area right. you'll be able right. to get there um, more than if you just tried to write a blog post um, inspiring action, right? The, yeah. the structure arrives at a moment that people go, oh, I get it. It clicks. It resonates so deeply that I feel the sudden urge to act. That is built. That is a skill you can learn. It is not like lightning struck you and you have this great idea or this creative skill to deliver amazing writing or sound bites. That lightning can be bottled. That's what a craft is. It is a thing you practice and get better at. So imminent, amazing, infinite kudos to the person who wrote this, you've slapped down some raw clay on the table in front of you. And now the real work is shaping it and applying pressure and removing and adding until you feel like this is something that I can now share with somebody else. Jay, this was absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for the time today. Uh, where can we find you online? All the places, not all the places. <laughs> um, Jayaconzo.com has all my projects more information about what I do, but also what I'm about. Um, so that's a great jumping off point is my website. And if you love podcasts, you know, and you, you're kind of tired of the same old style podcast, especially for marketers and professionals, um, give Unthinkable a chance. We're launching episode 200 later this week. I am so excited for that. I'm also putting the Unthinkable podcast page uh, on in the chat here. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much again, Jay. Uh, if you are new to the show, we are having Eddie Schleiner of Very Good Copy next week. Uh, very excited about that. He's going to be uh, editing a 400-word article. We have a challenge for the community here, uh, something we've never done before. And then after that, we're going to be doing wrapping up the year with a special holiday episode with uh, me and you. So thank you so much, everyone. 